Welcome everybody back to another episode of Beyond the Yellow Tape. My name is Julian. This is Nitty in association with Women in Forensics for this beautiful National Forensic Science Week. That was a mouthful. Today we have Alex, who is a crime scene investigator working out, working out of Florida. She's been in the field for a couple of years now, and uh, she's working on her master's in forensic, in forensic medicine, which is crazy. She also runs a small shop creating forensic merchandise called Before the Crypt. And any chance she gets, she tries to uh, share her life experiences. So we just appreciate that we, we can have Lex here with us today to uh, share some more experiences with us for this beautiful National Forensic Science Week. Ooh. And Nettie, I'll let you take it from there. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julian, for the introduction. Um, so uh, considering your background, the first question that actually pops in our head is, um, as we do forensic science masters, like we do not come across a lot of people who do forensic medicine as their masters. Um, so would you give us a little bit of an idea as to what the forensic medicine entails and like what was your inspiration to uh, get a master's in forensic medicine? Absolutely. So I, I'm just somebody that I just really love school. So finishing my bachelor's, I was just craving, like, of course, with forensic institutions, it's really hard to get training all the time. And then you get, you take away from work. So I was like, I need something to stimulate my mind. So I started looking into grad schools and graduate degrees, but I, I was on the fence about it. Cause I'm like, do I need to start school again? And finding a right program that works with the, the work schedule and everything too. So finding forensic medicine was great. It's one of the newer programs through the university of Florida. Um, I had uh, some of my professors go through UF's um, forensic science masters, and they, they they had a really good experience. It's primarily online, which is great working in the field that I can kind of come home and I'm not dedicated to it. I'm not doing a thesis route solely because of just the time into it. I, I considered it and I wanted to, and I said, no, I'm writing off way more than I could chew, which is great that they have that non-thesis option for someone who's still not traditional. And Definitely. pretty much- Forensic medicine is death investigation. So it's a lot of medical legal topics in um, going through classes that are particularly catered to medical legal death investigation. Right now I'm in osteology and forensic communications. So report writing, keeping out bias, and then learning about the human skeleton. We're learning about all the, the bones in the skull this week, which is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then going on to like trauma analysis, forensic medicine, one, two, and three, um, being able to do etymology and anthropology. UF has a great etymology program. They have a great anthropology background. So it's very good that we have professors with this background. And it's really important for me if I'm going to continue my education and work in death investigation to try to get as much as I can. And death investigation courses are hard to come by unless you're already working for a medical examiner or working in the field in that part of the field. So I figured, hey, let me go continue my education I'll look more profitable. Like I'll look better on my resume if I'm applying for that. And it just helps me show my specialization. So in court, if I do get the chance to testify and I'm able to include some more determinations, I have that background. And that's really important right. for forensic professionals to have all that training in your background. So if I'm, if I'm testifying to it, I'm able to say, how are you, how do you know this? Here you go. Here's my master's. Here's my third piece of paper. All right. That's that, that's really interesting. Do 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 you uh, need to be uh, a doctor? Uh, I think that would just be necessary if you are a forensic pathologist, correct? Right. So yeah. anything dealing with forensic pathology, that would be, I think, overall, I believe it's like 14 years of school. You have to go through a residency um, specializing in pathology. I considered that too, but mm -hmm. the all the extra doctoral side was beyond me and it wouldn't let me, I always, I also considered as well, I wouldn't be in the field if I was continuing my education further and that need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. So considering the residency and how difficult it can be, even though you do become that doctor um, and then primarily dealing with pathology and forensic pathology. Uh, it's cool because forensics is just pretty much, they just slap that term on and boom, science. Yeah. And so you have pathology. True. And then forensic pathology, and then you have that whole separate section. Correct. It's a it's a very applied field then, like, so it can be applied in multiple disciplines. And it's really interesting that you have 
a scope to get into anthropology, death investigation. Um, do you, so it's more, to my understanding from how you described, is it more like on crime scene um, course than being in the lab? Um, or do you also have an option of like getting into toxicology side of the lab work and DNA side? Or, or is it like more towards crime scene investigation, like medical legal death investigation, like being on the field itself? I think it's more field based, which is great for me because we have, I know I went to a small private university that was pretty much the only university to offer field based training or field based mm -hmm. courses. So having UF having that is great. Something like the forensic science masters, that's going to be like your hard sciences and furthering yeah. into if you want to do toxicology, a lot of individuals who are going for those chemistry, forensic chemistry backgrounds will yeah. typically go into that and then go into their PhDs. Correct. So yeah. it's a great stepping stone up if that's what someone's considering. But at least for me, I'm happy that I found something that is completely applicable to the field. A lot of what we're learning, right. it helps me visualize. So if I see it on scene, I'm able to identify and put a proper label to it. Sometimes we go on scene and I'm like, what am I looking at? Okay. So it's nice to be able to be the one in the room saying, I know what that is. I can wow. recognize that. I understand what I'm looking at. Even though we have the medical examiner coming out to scenes, it's great to still be able to, at least in my team, if there's a question, hey, you know, I had a bone on scene. What is this? Like, you know, does this look like scavenger? Look at this decomposition. What, what are we looking at? Look at the bugs. What is it saying? I'm able to at least partially, I'm still learning, but at least yeah. start mm -hmm. to articulate certain things of that nature. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, I do have one more question before I yes. hand the mic over to Julian, sorry. Uh, so when, so like you do work in a crime lab and you do, do crime investigation, um, where did you see in that path of yours, like working in the field, a need to get a master's? Like what was your motivation to get a master's? Uh, um, because yeah, no, go ahead. Because I, because I think that I've uh, come in contact with a lot of people like who do not necessarily go for masters, but like with their experience, they are enough knowledgeable to work in the field. Because like every case in forensic is new, right? Right. Um, so you learn with your experience. So where in this uh, picture do you see that it was important for you to get your masters, and how do you think it is going to help you? Which you I did think... mention a little bit, but like in depth a little. Yeah. I, I think, it, and I've been told by many, I've been told by a lot that you do not need a master's, just stick with your bachelor's, that's enough. But I'm always a, high, a believer in higher education and I want to be a tool in my unit. I want to be available. It's something that I genuinely like studying. So that's great because I actually enjoy studying. I enjoy learning the knowledge. I enjoy doing the assignments and researching more because it keeps me busy. And I consider it supplemental to forensic training because I can't always go to a 40 hour class. I can't always take time off. Maybe not even the department may not even cover some of these classes and they're 500, 600, oh. $1,000. So for me, it's a way to continue my education and make sure that I have a specialty that's unique to my unit and being able to be of service for my community too. Um, and I'm just a big believer in higher education. I've always achieved, I've always wanted to achieve my master's. I'm a first generation college student. I'd be the first person in my entire family of Latino, uh, a Latino family to have a master's degree. That's and, amazing. And it's, it's a stepping stone too, for me to start teaching. A lot of colleges ask for master degrees and PhDs, at least entry level master degrees. So if I want to be considered at least a fellow in a lot of these, even though I'm not doing my thesis, I still want to have a tool and say, look, I put in the work. I did my master's. I have all the higher education and I believe with all of this, I'm qualified to teach. Yes. No, but that's really a very different take that we have never experienced when we have been interviewing people because it's like very methodical, uh, like DNA, like toxicology, where you know like what you're getting into, like so structured. This is also very structured, but like, like how you got into the field and how you got into like studying is it's very unique. Like kudos to you. That's amazing. <laughs> it, it's definitely, it's definitely something that happens. It's, it's every, I always say, I was just talking to someone today, every journey for a forensic professional is different. Right. And our unit right. is multifaceted with individuals that come from photography backgrounds, law enforcement or, or none, or just criminal justice. And yeah. it's not easy to get in the field, but I always want to make sure that I, I keep my spot because cool. just as easy as you can, as, as hard as it is to get in, 
once you're in, I never want to ever be close to that chopping block or not seen as an asset for my unit. And that you got to continue your education. You have to further your knowledge, even when everyone tells you not to. And I've heard that right. a lot with my bachelor's. I heard that a lot. I hear it a lot with my master's. Oh, that's useless. I don't care if they don't pay me more. This is for I, me. This yeah. is for what I believe in. This is for my ability to go higher. Yes. No, that's really, that's really commendable. <laughs> um, I'll hand the mic to Jillian because I will not stop asking questions. <laughs> If any, if anybody give you any problems, to tell them Joe Biden give him back ten k, so it'll be all right. But um, <laughs> yes, thank you, Joe, because mm -hmm. I'm putting it right back. <laughs> um, so I know I was looking at your page a couple of days ago too, and you put up a post about how um, I guess uh, your first love was like um forensic sketch art. So what does that kind of entail? So is and. Forensic sketch art, that was one of the first things. So I was an artist before crime scene in general. I was one mm -hmm. of those artists that was ready to go starve in art school for four years. <laughs> and I had dreams of being an anatomy artist. Everyone okay. in my high school couldn't stand my portfolio. They thought it was gross. I was just drawing anatomical hearts and, and, and anatomically correct skulls. And that was something I really prided myself in. So I kept getting beat down. Don't bother. You're not going to do it. And I just wanted to see what else was out there. So I started looking into how do you do art in a, a job? I was watching Dexter. I saw him taking photos <laughs> of Great crime thing. scenes. Yeah, Great yeah. Thing. He's taking photos of crime scenes. Like I could get paid to do that. So in that rabbit hole I'm going through, I find forensic sketch art. And that's crazy enough. That was one of the things that got me into this field and have yet to find proper training or even to pursue that. I've kind of put that on the back burner. But you could be the pioneer of that. And I yeah. want to, because I, I can't find any trainings. I found maybe a couple professionals, but it seems like the art of forensic sketch art is very hush. So I'm every day I'm looking like I just want to take a class, even if it's just something for just building a facial portrait. Um, yeah. But kind of when we do crime scene sketches, I'm all over it. Let Give me the scene. Give me the layout. I'll do it, it. I'll do it 3D. I'll do it in the crime zone. And I will do a nice illustrated crime scene sketch. I'm one of the people that will sketch everything. I sketch robberies. I sketch my homicides, whatever I can do to visualize. Because it's just useful in court. And some people can't articulate it. And I'm very blessed that I can. That's amazing. Mm. I was actually going to ask you a question in the same uh, realm. Uh, in regards to uh, facial uh, artists, like mm. when you give them description as to some person that you might have encountered and like they draw photos, like, is that something you do as well? Or like, is that something a common practice uh, right now? Or it's all like AI now? I know there's an individual in our um, department. He actually did my polygraph. So I thought it was cool finding out later. He does sketch art for our agency, which is great. I don't do that. Typically us CSIs don't. If that's something I specialize in, that would kind of be something on the side. But I know a lot of the times, um, a lot of forensic sketch artists, you like you were saying, they use the digital. I don't remember her, her Instagram handle, but she's a forensic sketch artist that does missing individuals and, and children and age progression. And her work is phenomenal. And she's doing it digitally. But a lot of those individuals, from what I've researched, also do it 3D. They get the clay, they get the hand molds out. And they're able to recreate based on those skeletal features, the skin impressions and the, how the face possibly looked. So it's definitely something that I'm hoping I can get more info and be a part of to talk about it because it's not talked about at all. Okay. So at least just me mentioning it, yeah, if it yeah. means people right. come out of the woodwork and talk about it, yeah, yeah, say, yeah. hey, I know a training, then let's start, let's start that conversation. Yeah. Correct. And that's how you spread the word, right? Like you yeah. to be on platforms like this for like smaller fields so that we can talk about it and like see as to what the traction is in the field and where it's going and what's the need and how to, I don't know, problem solve. I will basically. say it's definitely a more smaller niche. Correct. It's probably one of the smallest niches in forensics that I've found just because not many people do it. You have your select few and you call on them when you need it. We're fortunate. I've seen in agencies around us that we don't have a need, which is fantastic, but there is that time where you do, where you yeah. can identify somebody or you find skeletal remains and they're able to make a, a DNA profile. And I know a lot of um, ge um, the genetic genealogy, they're able to make DNA profiles and almost build 
somebody based on what DNA they found. So I think that's incredible that they're able to advance that way. Yeah. And it's always there if we need it. Yeah. That's the beauty about forensics. You'll never know when you need it until you need it. <laughs> that's, a that's a fact. Um, um let, let me let me get this one, Nitty. Hold on, I got one. Um <laughs> I know uh, you've been in the field for a couple of years. So did you start in COVID? Like when yes. COVID was going on? So could I'm you describe COVID, how- I'm a COVID baby CSI, yes. Yeah, I started in January in Florida. So I feel like, yeah. I don't know if COVID hit Florida, how COVID hit everybody else. So could you describe how, um, uh, I guess one, starting in COVID and two, starting in COVID in Florida. Just because I know COVID had I'm in New York, Nitty's in Philly. COVID had this is, you know, a little more lax with the uh with the uh, regulations, I'll say. So could you describe how I guess that was and just starting out in COVID? Yeah, I'll say I technically my start date was in December. It was probably about a couple months hiring process, but I didn't start till January 7th. So here I am. I'm so excited. I had just got it into the relationship now that I'm in. And I'm like, wow, I got the dream job. I got my dream boyfriend. This is great. And then right. March 2020 comes around. I'm like, at like the, the gears stop. I'm phase three. Everything's going. And then the whole city shuts down. And right. we ended up pretty much having to cease a lot of smaller calls and, and burglaries and things like that and leave it strictly up to patrol because of just how dangerous it was to be out to limit mm -hmm. our exposure. So it took away a lot of my training exposure and getting cut loose a couple months after that in the middle of COVID, it just added this extra fear because I'm always hyper vigilant of, of one, the surroundings, two, um, whatever narcotics are on scene. Of course, fentanyl is mm -hmm. always a huge issue. And as a newbie, I was always for, I just have the most irrational fear that I'm gonna, just gonna come across fentanyl and drop. Just something that I've always had in the back of my head. I know it's not, yeah. it doesn't happen every day. But being new and hearing about, especially now, I know in Florida, fentanyl is a really, really big issue and across the uh -huh. United States. So I'm thinking, oh no, I'm worried about drugs. I'm worried about the environment. And now I'm worried about, is this house COVID infected? Am I gonna bring COVID home to my family? So it was a lot of scaling back. We did a lot more processing and I was able to work on my in-lab work, but it, it was weird to see the city so low volume because everyone was locked down and then over the past year or so everything's just ramping up and it scenes that i've never had exposure to now i'm having exposure to and i'm like wow it's been like two years court i still believe it or not i have not testified in court yet because mm. all the cases happen in the middle of covid and all now right. it's starting so now i'm getting subpoenas and now i have my trial appearances and it's just like everything now is coming at once Especially right, since right, right. Florida kind of came back to life a little quicker than the rest of the, the United States. Good it way to started put it. out of nowhere, just like our holidays and our busy days that a lot of my coworkers are like, oh, we get a ton of calls that day. I'm just like twiddling my thumbs, like, where are the calls? And mm -hmm. then now I give it a year and now we're running around crazy. So That's it was good. just a different environment, that fear of the unknown. Bad enough we have that in law enforcement and in forensics that added like a new layer of just being careful wearing your PPE, being aware of your surroundings and, and working with victim suspects and officers too. Um, I was fortunate, I did not catch COVID until um, this year when I was with family. So nothing, no right. work exposures, no nothing. Um, and our unit's been good about just making sure everyone stays put, stays home. So we didn't come and do that because our fear is what happens when the whole unit goes down? What happens when everyone gets COVID? Yeah, and right. we never wanted that reality and never wanted to do that to, to the community either. That would be a disservice. So we all just try to be responsible and take care of ourselves. And we, we were good about masking up and just protecting our loved ones in, in the community, which is it's great to see that we were able to do that. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's very nice and seems to be a very interesting experience. <laughs> It's definitely <laughs> yeah. my calls. I've been ha I, I always get the crazy calls or, you know, calls of, of that nature that I are almost delayed to, to me. They feel delayed. It's something that I should have had at the start of my career. And now I'm getting them. But I think as of now, of course, we know COVID is not 100% gone, but a lot of things have normalized out to normal call volumes when it comes to what we see on the daily and what we can respond to now. We're pretty much back. I think most it, 
agencies throughout the United States are back to normal protocol. Yeah. Right. Um, would you be able to like explain um, just in brief as to what your job and your work entails so that the audience would know as to what the, what's actually it is in real life and it's on TV shows and we can like have a better idea. So we know what to expect True. when we're looking for jobs like yours. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing that you see like CSI shows and you have one person doing the interrogating and they're doing the evidence collection and they're doing the confirmatory tests. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't imagine if that was my job title. We, I call ourselves the middlemen. We're the middle responders. We, when uh, officers need us, we're able to respond out to a call and we're, we take photos, we take video, we take our hand sketches or hand measurements, or we utilize laser technology, like the laser scanners, like the construction laser scanners, and we document our scene. However it needs, whether it's a robbery up to a homicide, of course, there's various protocols for much larger cases, but we do it all from small burglaries up to, you know, homicides and things of that nature and recover remains. Um, we document and then we determine processing evidence collection we bring it back to our lab, then we can do further processing, further documenting, further um, photography. A lot of times we're doing more photography. Yeah, second responders is literally it. We're not first, we're not last, but we're second. We're, <laughs> we're somewhere in that Fair middle. And people, that's why people forget about us because we're, we're like sandwiched in. Um, after we go through, if we do further processing, further documenting, mm -hmm. We package our evidence and send it into our property evidence unit and write our supplements of our involvement and testify. So it's strictly field work. We're quite literally going based on under a detective's direction. All right, what's pertinent? What needs to come back? What needs to be photographed based on the case? And then going and um, putting that through and sending it to the lab. So a lot of, if I need um, confirmatory results that gets sent to our local lab and they do all of that. If we okay. need a fingerprint identification that gets sent to our latent print unit. So okay. we're literally the middleman. Mm -hmm. we, we grab everything and we send it out into a big web and then we get those results back. But we only testify to exactly what we did. Okay. And then whoever those um, results come from, they testify and they kind of fill those puzzle pieces in. Okay. So we're like the center of the puzzle and everybody is fixing and putting the picture together. Yeah. So I'm sure like chain of custody would be like one of the biggest training assets for you guys, because considering you're getting it from the crime scene, sending it to other people, like different departments for testing, getting it back and then testifying. Absolutely. Would you have any experience to share where you would have seen uh, the positive and the negative sides of like um, documentation where it could go like really bad? or it has gone like really good and does it help your case? Um, um, I don't have anything in general that I could say or, but like, let's say in hypothetical, if I have a case that I don't document enough, if I don't write who I get the item from, if I don't label it as such, if I don't photograph it and I just send it off into the abyss, it's, it's kind of lost out there. So when being introduced in court, if I don't even document it well or at all in a supplement, that's going to be a question. And we try not to leave those gap holes, those loopholes there for defense to come in and start chewing us out. They right. we are the witness that they want to make. They want us to look like we don't know what we're doing because we're right. the favorite witness. The jury wants to see the CSI. And that's something that we are trained on. The jury wants to see us in any way that we can be painted as insufficient for our job and make the jury have a doubt as to protection of evidence and chain of custody that's their route. And I can't ever fault them for that because that's how you show that proper defense in case there is error. So the best practice is always just documenting everything, sketching where that item was, taking photos. There's never enough photos that you can take on scene. Documenting um, and labeling properly. Who did you get it from? Some um, agencies even require what time did you get it on scene? Correct. And, and putting those identifiers through, keeping that description consistent through and making sure your packaging reflects it and then documenting that in your report. So now you have, you have your physical description, you have your item with that description. You have photographs showing that item before in C2, before you move it. And then after mm -hmm. you move it, you put scale to show sizing. So you can explain it and put it as an exemplar in court. So rather you taking the whole item out of the bag, show them a picture and you're able to show 
that item through its journey and you're able to record that accurate chain of custody. That's always the best case scenario when the defense has nothing and they'll come for your character rather than what you did because yeah. everything is tight. And that's a lot of the times that's how most of our cases are. We really try to make sure everything's tight so there's no questions and we have that evidence nice and secure. The last thing I ever want is the key piece of evidence that had the DNA or let's say had the, the, the print being questioned. Because once that item is in question, the results from that item go out the door. Yeah. Right. Um, being that um, you're in Florida, and since you're responding to these scenes, um, do you ever, and I know sometimes it gets really hot down there, and sometimes it's old, it could be uh, raining, it could be very humid. Uh, are those like weather factors, like, do you come across those factors often when you're at a scene, like whether it be humidity, heat, a lot of rain, that may, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That may just hinder you when you're at a crime scene, that may hinder you in doing your job. I could tell you I'm watching my window right now and the wind is picking up and it looks nasty out there. So yes, we get a lot of those summer storms um, and that pretty much when we get that call out, checking the weather, checking outside and me knowing, all right, when I get there, I need to bust my camera out and I need to take some photos and document as much as I can before moving that fragile evidence. That fragile evidence sometimes may have to be picked up and due to inclement weather. And I'll document that in my report because of the inclement weather. We describe a lot of our major cases, we'll describe the scene. So I'll notate it as you know a rainy, windy night to notate that that condition is exactly how I responded to. Um, so it's just, it's usually a battle, especially in Florida. Sometimes the rainstorms come in five seconds and then they go away. Right. Um, the heat is definitely a factor just physically and mentally being out on a scene in June and being out on the same scene, let's say in December is two different worlds because of that heat. It just takes right. everything out of you, even getting in and out of the van. I'm huffing and puffing, no matter how fit you are. We, we're fortunate we don't have a lot of uniform, like um, a lot of extra things on our uniform, but usually wow. we're on all black with our BDUs and we're dragging. So it can be difficult to navigate the, the heat, but just staying hydrated and checking in, taking frequent breaks when we need it and still keeping an eye on our scene. That's what I usually do. Having a big old water jug and the AC in the van blasting. So when I need all a break, right. I blast my face with AC and get my head in the game. And usually I'll go through my checklist. What do I need to do next? And even with the weather, we will be out there for hours. Our job is more, how do I say, with, even with the challenges of like a scene, a difficult scene with weather, I don't ever want to try to rush. Even if the weather seems scary and bad, obviously for safety, you have to keep in mind, but I just want to make sure I'm getting it all. And if I'm uncomfortable and hot now, I always tell myself, just do your job get it out of the way because you get to go home tonight and cool down. And that right. to me is obviously I'm not going to put my health in jeopardy if I'm overheating, I'm overheating, but I always pace myself and make sure that I'm still giving my all despite my discomfort. And that's something new CSIs need to understand that you're going to be in very uncomfortable temperatures and climates, you know, dark, hot homes or homes that haven't had AC on in mm -hmm. months or weeks. And sometimes you have to put those discomforts aside and consider that your job still needs to be done because at the end of the day, court doesn't care about your comfort. They care about the evidence and you can't risk evidence because of that discomfort. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Good point. That's again, very commendable. <laughs> it looks it's hard. It's hot. Yeah. I will tell you, I'm, I have like the worst farmer's tan and I, I just, you know, my hair is dried out. But, you know, not everyone can do it. And if that's, if I'm willing to do it and I have that heart, I might as well just do it. Yeah. Yeah, right. it seems very easy on television, but when you actually go and do it, in reality, it's a completely different picture. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's why, like your, uh, what you mentioned is so important for not only for like us, but also like the audience to know that we, all of this, like, is very, very important if you choose to be in CSI, if you wish to work in forensics, you need to have gut when you go to a crime scene to see what's in front of you. So it's a lot of things in picture. Amazing. And I promise exactly. you, there's no there's no makeup on on scenes. I fix myself up when I need to, but I don't even put my eyebrows on. I just go straight into it because the, the last thing I need is to be drenching, 
being drenched in sweat and then yeah. having all of that going through the cross contamination. I can't imagine, cannot imagine. Oh. Bare oh, face, fun. put some sunscreen on and go into it. <laughs> yeah. right. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> of course. Just a little bit of like switching the gears. Um, so we, like we mentioned in your bio that you do have a startup uh, where you do sell your merchandise. Um, so what was your motivation behind first the name and the second, like having a store online to like sell your merchandise? Like what made you do it? So I originally started before the Crips because I wanted a place to discuss like a lot of my challenges being first generation, being even first generation in law enforcement, trying to navigate that. And being in college, I didn't have any mentors, even online that I could look up to. There was nobody out there telling their story. There was nobody out there sharing their experience. And I felt like it was big mystery. And I absolutely, I love mysteries and crime scene. I hate them in reality. There's it, a lot of this, a lot of what we do can't be told to the public just for a sake of, I don't want to tell people how we process every little item because then they're going to make sure that they avoid that. Can but I, I want to still make sure that people who are willing to be in this field, who have that same sense of, I don't know where to start. That's where, that's where I come in. So I wanted before the crypt, it's just kind of a play on words talking about me talking about my experiences prior before the crypt, before that death, because I have a background um, in funeral service. I worked in the funeral service industry in college. So yeah. I wanted to also talk about death experience and death care. And I wanted to talk about the things that happened before and after death. So using before the crypt represents everything that happens before and then allowing me to still talk about the after too. And working okay. on the business, I really wanted somewhere that's appropriate. That was my biggest thing. I love the witty designs about, you know, I'm a CSI and they'll never find you. But I something I always think, would I wear that around my chief? Would that wear would I wear that around a superior? Is that really appropriate if a family, if I'm walking out and somehow someone recognizes me? I always think about the the bigger ripple. And I wanted forensic merchandise that wasn't all full of blood and gore. I wanted something a little bit more sophisticated that I could wear to trainings or I could wear out and still show my pride of being in forensics, but taking away that gore factor. Because I, I I work with more processing requests than I do deceased individuals. Right. Our job is not all death and blood and gore, I'll, even though the media will show us out on those scenes. So I wanted to be able to articulate items imagery and, and clothing that we can all represent and use like at trainings, at conventions, out out on bow, or if I'm walking into the office, I always consider if I'm going in on an off day to get a report for court, you know, it, it is my outfit appropriate? And I don't really have to think about that when I have, you know, my items on, or if I have a bag, a school bag. And I consider too, when I was in college, I wanted cool forensic merch. I was forensic major. Yeah. I want a cool bag to put my stuff in. I want a cute right. pencil pouch, some stickers. And I really couldn't find any. And there was nothing that I was so sure that like, yeah, this is appropriate. To me, I always think about, again, the latter. And I'm like, you know what? Someone needs to make designs. It's just easy to digest. They still represent us, but they're not there for shock factor. Okay. Everyone loves forensic for the shock factor. I have never been in it for the shock factor. So I wanted my products and my, my blog and my brand to represent taking away that shock factor. This is forensics. This is real. We're real people. Some of us, I know some CSIs, they do not like blood and gore. They don't have a skull anywhere. They are very minimalistic. And I want to still be able for them to enjoy items without, oh, you know, blood spatter and skulls and the body, the chalk outline, just something different, something right. new, fresh for at least that. I would say the clothing industry, but it's just mainly for us to represent ourselves. Correct. No, that's yeah. a very beautiful thought. And that was also what we in Beyond the Yellow Tape are trying to do as well. And even like women in forensics to tell stories about people, not stories, but also like their experiences in the field. What was their motivation to study what they're doing? What were their career paths? Because after you get into forensic, it's very difficult sometimes like, oh, is DNA better? Is tox better? Is CSI better? So you're learning from people. It's really good so that students or incoming students, new students, people across the borders, like I'm from India. Um, 
and also I'm an international year first in my family to do forensic science. So it's very difficult for us to like communicate and tell as to what the applications are to people, to my family or to people around. So I think it's a good platform. Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm sure it would be very helpful for whoever listens to the talks in the future. Thank Absolutely. you. And very good motivation story. And also like combining your love for art um, with your merchandise and your work, it's a beautiful am amalgamation, I feel. And it's like therapy to me. Um, I, I'm very open with the fact that this field is hard. Like yeah. this field can be very hard. I've had hard cases. I've had two very hard cases this year that I can't really go into detail of, but even thinking about them brings tears to my eyes. And I don't know why. Just some things just hit you harder than others. So coming home and they always say, keep a separate, like don't put work as your personality. Mm -hmm. And sadly, sorry, I'm a forensic major. I think everybody in forensics has it as a part of their personality because it's community service. It's how we serve and it's how we are able to provide for community, for our families, for ourselves. And, I, mm -hmm. um, and it was really important for me to, to understand that I can come home and still draw my anatomy. And it helps great for a second income because masters, it ain't cheap. I'll tell you that much. And price of living, it ain't cheap. So it's just a nice cushion to let me start getting out of debt. I was a broke college kid. My my, I worked three jobs and it barely paid for my car. So mm -hmm. I had a lot of debt accumulated from my bachelor's degree. And when the world shut down, I'm like, oh my God, how do I even make a second income? Because the crime scene, we don't get paid great. I mean, we get enough to live. I'll tell you that much. And we're, we're government workers, but that doesn't mean that we get paid luxurious. It's very yeah. hard to get paid luxurious. And even if you are a supervisor and you're getting paid a great sum, you have a lot of responsibility. And sometimes the yeah. amount of work and time we put into it never will, e it will never equal the pay. Yeah. And the things that we take home with us, no money can buy that away. Correct. So I use it as a therapy and a coping mechanism. It connects me with people. It lets people enjoy what I'm, it's just, it's just a great tool for me to connect with people when I can't vocalize it. Yes. Especially on some days, I'll tell you some days I come home and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do crime scene. I don't know how people have done it for 20 years and being able to come home and draw and appreciate or research and draw, it really helps me remember why I do it and why I've done it. Yeah. Could you uh, give us a couple of examples of some of the things you sell on the site? I sell little pullovers like this, pretty simple support your local crime scene unit, which is important for um, forensics week, support your local forensic unit. I saw a lot of stationary items that I would consider, like I have them all over my desk uh, from trinket trays, notebooks, uh, pen, um, pencil pouches, stickers are the biggest. Those are pretty much like my main, my main popular item. I sell a lot of merchandise onto shirts. I've started making cups. So making different cups of vinyl and sublimation methods. And then just recently I launched into a third party provider because I'm very blessed. The demand is far more than I can ever do in my tiny Florida apartment. So I've had to outsource a lot of my designs and they're still just as popular right now. I think my most popular is my crime scene ghost hoodie or a sweatshirt that everyone likes ghost. As you can see, I totally <laughs> love ghost. I love all the spooky things. So that was definitely something that people have been enjoying. I try to make a little bit of everything. So if you don't want to wear a shirt that says forensics, maybe you'll want a mouse pad, or maybe you just want a little sticker to go on your gear case. And there you go. And different things that represent different sayings, or even something saying forensic etymologist, I'll get messages like, oh my God, I can't find anything with etymology and you have a sticker for us. So I always try to incorporate the bigger um, forensic branches and then the little ones too. So everybody has that inclusion. It's, definitely, it's amazing. Definitely. That's a wide variety of things to buy. People, please I, I go try. check our website and buy stuff. Um, All right, we definitely got to plug that before that. Um, <laughs> I actually, um, I, you were saying earlier that you wanted to uh, teach forensics. Um, is, that, is that true? Did I hear that right? Yes, that's the goal. And my five-year plan, I want to be in an institution and I still want to work full-time or part-time at least in forensics. I want to teach and work in the field both. Do you want to teach a specific discipline or, um, or what? 
possibly if I'm with my master's in death investigation, or at least just offer basic crime scene field training for students or working at a college. I know my old university, um, I went to Kaiser University and they have a forensic program that it seems like is dying out a little bit. So I'm hoping that give me two years and then I'll get into the teaching field and be able to to reach out and actually get students that want to be involved. Um, right. Kaiser has opportunities for adjuncts to just come in and teach. And a lot of their professors are still working in the fields or they're retired out of the fields too. Or even if I work with a forensic company and do trainings and teach in that nature and doing conferences, if I can't go right into a school and even high school, I'd totally consider working at a high school. If it means enriching the youth and showing them forensics. And I feel like it's really important that I keep my crime scene background because a lot of trainers, they get out of the field to teach and they start getting out of touch and they start losing that field experience. They don't understand what the people in the field are going through. And a lot of individuals in those classes is like respect thing. Well, you know, you're teaching crime scene from two years ago. Like it's so different now. You don't understand. So I still want to be able to still work in the field serve my community and then go and teach it and show them, you know what, I just had a scene like this. And I really, really, really want to get that out there. Yeah, no, I'll go, I'll be your replacement. <laughs> I'll go in and do that. I That's absolutely amazing. would love to, I, I love Kaiser. I'm glad that they, Polk County, absolutely. I would absolutely love to. And that's why a lot of programs, they don't have the field. And that's why I want to at least teach in the field, even if it's general crime scene, even if it's just a photography class and at least give that, hey, I'm going to teach you. But just so you know, last night I stayed up to three o'clock in the morning because I got called out doing the same thing I'm teaching you. And I feel like that real world application is huge. That's what students need. And that's the biggest disconnect with forensic schooling is they don't have real world interaction at all. True. Um, I have one question before we open up for the audience and if they have any questions. Yes. Um, so it's a very philosophical question. So oh, what's the one of what's one of the most important lessons you have learned over your career um, that would help our audiences to, you know, gauge and understand as to. I have a lot. <laughs> oh. It's crazy because crime scene and seeing how people live and the things that they go through. And my biggest, the thing that I've learned is have compassion that yes, you know, there's the risk of bias, but there's nothing wrong with having compassion for the people that you serve. And I feel like having a minimal amount of compassion allows me to put effort into that work without feeling like it's just another case. And it's easy when you get 20 burglaries in a row, you're done. Like you don't want to work another burglary in your life. You lose that compassion. And you stop working hard on that case and you stop not saying that that's happened to me, but just hypothetical, you stop putting in that all. And the day that you stop putting in that all, you're doing a disservice to your community. There are so many individuals who want to be in forensics and they need the ability to get into the field. And if you're going to start, start losing your compassion, I feel like that's the biggest career killer. You need to care about where your work ends up. You need to care about the people you're serving. You need to care about you as a a professional. And losing that compassion, you start becoming dead inside. I always tell myself the day I walk into work and I lose compassion and I can't find it, I quit. I have to. I absolutely have to. Because we see some of the worst things in the world. We see individuals that I just feel for them. And I know that I have that compassion. I understand what I need to do. I put the rest aside and I'm able to work and power through. That's how I get through those tough calls. I have that compassion. And I understand through that compassion, leaving out bias, that if I don't do this, they will never get answers. I need to care. I need to stay late. I need to put all my all into this report. I need to take that extra photo because if I don't, that can make or break the case. If I don't swap, I know I'm tired or I know I want to go home and go hang out with my fiance or go to that game and go to that show. But if I don't get this one swap, if I don't have the heart to, it it could really make a difference in somebody's life. Yeah, Compassion is huge. And we, we experience compassion fatigue a lot of the times, even though we don't work directly with the public, you know, you see all these cases and just start hurting your heart. 
but that's when you, you have a limit. And I have my compassion meter. When it goes too full, I pull back because too full, it induces bias. And when I go too empty, I try to push forward that love and for what I do remind myself, if I don't have compassion, I don't have anything. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> uh, so I open the, uh, the floor to our audience. If they have any questions for you, um, please uh, unmute yourself and ask a question or you can put it in the chat and we can ask um, questions on your behalf. Yes, anything and everything. I know a lot of my followers said they couldn't tune in live. So I definitely, I'll be linking them to yes. YouTube. A lot of them are working. It's forensic week, so we're slammed. True, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Question for you. Yeah. Um, I'm Leji Boone, a, a, a former crime scene investigator, current professor at um, Kaiser, and I still work uh, with the sheriff's office in Polk County. So I, I do think Leighton Prince and Shoe and Tire. Um, what it, do you consider to be your best uh, coping strategy when you come from a really traumatic scene? Um, my best coping strategy, I'm an overshare and I will just share everything. <laughs> and I will confine in somebody, whether it's a shift mate or even somebody outside of it, I'm very blessed to have a partner that is completely unrelated to forensics in general, completely away from law enforcement. So he kind of pulls me back and he's able to talk me and I'm describing everything. And he's like, Hey, honey, that's not okay. And he's able to steer me back. And I think talking, even though it's hard, and even though sometimes it's embarrassing to say, well, that call bothered me. And someone may reply, well, that was nothing. I've had worse. That like crushes mm -hmm. your spirit because yeah. some things resonate with you differently. Right. Yeah. And I just, you know, I feel if I talk to somebody, whether it's my parents, mm -hmm. a friend, and just say, hey, I just need an ear. Somebody give me an ear. Let me talk it out. Let me process it. Because a lot of the times we, it comes in through our audible, it comes in visual, but it's not coming out. And right. a lot of the trauma that we see, once I start articulating it, I'm like, whoa, that's not okay. And that's the first step to processing is sometimes just the full acknowledgement that what we saw was not humane, was not okay, was not right. Mm -hmm. And being able to talk. And a lot of, and therapists, I highly recommend anybody in the field, even if it's something as small as a burglary that's just bothering you, being able to talk to somebody, especially out of the field is, is really important. And taking that self-care too, coming home. Sometimes I don't open my phone. I don't look at my business. I don't look at schoolwork. I come home and just boop. Let me turn it off for a second. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's a really good advice. Talk. That's the best thing. No one will know what you're struggling with if you don't discuss it. You'd be surprised who else in your, your unit has had a similar call Correct. or something or a strategy that they've used. Or sometimes you just need to cry. I'm a crier. I come, I don't cry on scene. I'll, I I hold that composure and I come home and I just let it out. And yeah. being honest with your feelings in that burnout is one of the biggest things I think any prof forensic professional needs to have. It's okay to not be okay. Yeah. Cause there's that some days I'm really not okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to not be okay. It's a good quotable right there. Absolutely. It's okay to not be okay. Cause in the end, it'll go, it'll, it'll pass. It may not go right, away, right. but you're able to process and overcome. A lot of that trauma is so deep and so new. It just takes a little bit to get through. Um, any other questions? Anyone? I think we're good, man. I think we're good. Yes. Oh, I, hi, I'm sorry. My name's Nicole. Oh. Um, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say I've been following you for a while, and um, I think everything you're doing is really cool. From one CSI to another, you're awesome. Um, so definitely keep your head up. I've been in the field for a little over five years now, so it it does get better. It gets easier. You know, you get better in the routine. So just stay to, true to yourself. And I'm a training girl as well. So like, I love continuing education. So never leave, never lose that because it's very valuable. Oh, thank you. Damn me. I want to make sure that I don't lose you in all my DMs. That's so Okay, sweet. I will. I'm actually about to place the order for some stickers now. So Aww. there you go. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I welcome. Oh, and that's why I do it for, for people like you. Because sometimes we're just, we're quiet. We're forensic professionals. We go in, we keep our head down. 
we, we don't get named and it's just nice to be able to connect with people and make friends and at least make pe- people feel appreciated. So, you know, five years in, that's a lot. Yeah. Especially yeah. nowadays too. Like it's a lot. Yep. Yeah. So keep it up. Keep it up. You're doing great. Thank you. I so <laughs> appreciate you tuning in. You're and welcome. Checking out. Uh, we do have a question. Um, so the question is, what coping strategies do you have when you are on a scene that is particularly triggering? Um, coping strategies, I if I can't verbalize it, I'll write it down. I, oh. It's just something I, I write down a lot. I'm just so expressive that if I can't verbally say it, maybe it's not appropriate, um, I'll write it down. And I write a checklist and I try to identify. It's almost like scientific it's like process of elimination I'll look at the scene and be like what's bothering me and maybe I'll write down like a keyword you know what I'm seeing maybe the the smell maybe the individual is this familiar to me and start breaking down and identifying what's bothering me and then taking a step and then that's where that compassion comes in and almost like the adrenaline kicks in we get a lot of adrenaline adrenaline on these scenes and I think all right I have a case that I just want to crumble and go into a ball, but I can't imagine how the under other end of that, that case is. If I'm feeling like this now, how is that individual? How did that individual feel? Whether alive or deceased, especially if they're deceased, um, how did they feel before that passing and their family too. And I always feel like we're in between, we are the individuals that are in between that unbiased justice and in between being able to tell a story with evidence so it's it's hard to work through it I try to identify it and best I can I will say a lot of times I don't realize how triggering something is until I I come back I I've had a particular just case dealing with arson and there's there's sensory triggers when I smell certain things um looking back in the photos is really hard for me but at the time I was snapping those photos and doing everything just fine. And then you come back and you sit back and you're like, oh, that's hard. And it's a lot of the time our brain is, goes into survival mode. And I just really want to get that job done and do it good. And I just fall back on my forensic principles. When in doubt, I just I kind of unplug. I have exactly what I need. I know exactly what I need to do. That's why I write down checklists. What am I feeling? What do I need to do? And then go through my list and make sure it's detailed, knock everything off and then check in and being like, I did everything. Can I go now? <laughs> I need to go and process this. Um, so it's definitely difficult, but it's a lot of just, it's up to every each, each person. And I fortunately haven't had a scene that has been too triggering in the moment. It's okay. usually coming home that you have that trigger. And sometimes it follows you for the rest of your life. All right. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Angel. Thank you for um, talking. You're wonderful. Um, my question is, how do you, I always have this conversation with my friends all the time. How do you feel about the new, um, what is it, Jeffrey Dahmer series that's coming out? Do you think that, you know, I've been saying in the past couple of years that with, you know, serial killers and things like that, that it's being rehashed how do you feel do you feel like they're being put on a pedestal like I feel like we have like a weird obsession with like crime and murder and just putting them on a pedestal what are your opinions on that I'm glad you asked because I'm one of the people that (laughs) I don't like them at all and I, I always again that compassion I think about the families and that rehashing of their trauma And I'm a firm believer in knowing obviously who your suspect is for a horrible Mm -hmm. crime, but focusing on those victims and their names and honoring those legacies. Cause I I believe in as long as you speak someone's name, their legacy will never be forgotten. And a lot of these victims are robbed of their lives because of the selfishness of these individuals. Um, I'm all for ethical true crime. I enjoy a good true crime progress. I like being able to listen to cases because as a forensic professional, I think of you know, how would I have responded to that scene? You know, what evidence did they use to, to, to identify the suspect? And I'm like, wow, that's all they used? Like, I need to make sure I look out for that on my next scene. But there's a fine line between ethical true crime and telling the stories with permission and then something like that, just highlighting the serial killer 
And that's where I'm like, no, I, I can't stomach it. I don't want to see it. I actually don't even like horror. Do not like yeah. horror movies. I do not like seeing death on screen being enacted. I guess it's just something that's come about from the job and just, I just can't, I can't do it. I don't like true crime that's portrayed in extra form. Like the Ted Bundy series, I couldn't, could not watch it. It's not because I, I feel I'm sensitive to it or I feel like it shouldn't be out there, but I think of those families and a lot of those families now, there, a lot of these families, the victims' families are still alive. Mm-hmm. Like all these, these cases happened They're not in the thirties and forties, you know, they're the seventies, the eighties, and even the nineties. And we have to be respectful of those individuals. They didn't die to be put on a documentary and they didn't die for their individual, their, their, their their suspect to be plastered on t-shirts and be plastered on Netflix. You know, they, they passed in vain and they were robbed of their life. And I truly believe that we need to start going away from that and still telling their stories because a lot of families want that awareness and highlighting um individuals that also when they um they have foundations a lot of these victims have foundations where in these documentaries for Dahmer do they include the foundations do they include the scholarships a place to donate a place to honor the victim if you're gonna talk about it you need to make sure that you have a segment that shows these victims in true color we got to see the lavish lives of the serial killers, but what about the the victims? What about yeah. their families? That's just it's just not right. Yeah. yeah. I I always yeah. fear. I had uh, I was talking to a coworker and I told them if my if a case I work that's traumatic becomes a true crime case, I think I'm going to scream. Mm-hmm. I don't want that for my family. I don't want that for me. I don't want any part in a documentary unless it's for forensic furthering and education. Mm-hmm. I would not, as a professional, not be involved. And I know that that family wouldn't want to be involved either. Yeah. All right. Um, just one last okay. question uh, before we wrap it up. Um, so the question is, how do you balance work and personal life? Does it get difficult to separate the two? Can I say I don't balance? I, feel like I, don't. <laughs> I feel like I don't. I feel like I have no days off. I'm going to be real. It's hard. And it's something that I just try to plan my day and then you get stuck on a late call and then all your plans are out the door. So I just try to be real with my expectation. Like my orders, a lot of people wish they ship faster. It's eight to 10 business days. Sometimes I just, I just can't, um, I just can't get to it. I just can't get around to it. Um, so I just feel like being realistic and that's why I have open communication with my customers when it comes to the business, you know, let's say there's times where I forgot to put a sticker like oh my god I'm so sorry I'm packaging a bunch of orders I just got home from a long call maybe I didn't package an order or missed an item so I always remedy it and I always keep that communication hey I'm sorry your order is taking longer I just I just have no time and establishing that boundary of hey this is a part-time business it's not full-time because the full-time job takes up 90 percent 90 percent of the day and just get finding balance. Usually I'll be like, all right, work on orders tonight, study a little bit. Obviously I get my, my work day out first. I like to work before work in the morning. I work day shift. So I work my day shift 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then I get out and all right, boom, boom, boom. And then usually give myself some time for family and my fiance. Good answer. Commendable work, honestly. Thank you once again, like honestly, uh, so in- inspirational and such a beautiful you you said all things like in such a good manner for us to like understand also told us the positive and the negatives of being in a crimes investigator um, and also your journey for education so it was very insightful and thank you once again for your time um, and we'll definitely um, share this videos with you and for anyone who has questions later uh, we'll also give information about your um, Instagram page and uh, your email if you're fine with us sharing your email. Yeah. Um, and once again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad we have the same principles that align. It's yes. great to find yeah, like kind of people that want to represent the field properly. Yes. It's, it's yeah. now I'm happy to say it's not rare anymore. <laughs> it's great to see yeah. more and more young individuals like minded that really want to get the word out and in both good and bad. Yeah. Yeah. Just telling the truth Sorry. basically, right? It's, it's yeah, there's no, easier. there's no lies in forensics. So I'm not going to go out there and lie about yeah. what we do. Correct. That's right. And uh, the Instagram page is before the crip, right? Yes. 
And is there a website uh, along with that? Um, in the works, but right now, pretty much all my handles for my blog is before the crypt, Etsy is before the crypt, and anything gotcha. that is affiliated with me. Also, a reminder too, I have to put out there, I am not affiliated with any agency. I am my own entity. I am just a sole individual going out there and talking about my experiences, but nothing that I have said or done um, or spoken about reflects the agency. I have no affiliation to any agency right. or organization mentioned. All right. Well, everybody in the chat, everyone who's going to watch at some point in the future, make sure you get your orders in for your stickers, your mugs, your sweaters, your cups, your your hats, your shoes, your whatever y'all need. And uh, I think this was a great episode, man. I, I really enjoyed it. I think you blessed us with a lot of knowledge about a lot of things. Thank you for all the people who asked questions. This is our first time going live. So, you know, we're all really uh, nervous. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Lex. I was too. I was, I was, I was like, what are they going to ask me? Uh, and yeah, what can I, can, it, can, or can I say? So it was great. You guys are amazing. You guys asked the right questions. And to everybody asking questions too, thank you. Thank you so much once yeah. again for everyone joining in. It was uh, very good. It was really interesting to see like so many people joining in. It's like a first experience as well. So right. uh, do not forget to uh, visit her website, uh, her Instagram page and like definitely put in orders. Uh, and also do not forget to like, share and subscribe uh, Beyond the Yellow Tape and Women in Forensics as well. Um, so please stay tuned and hopefully over the week we'll have more interesting videos coming up. Um, and thank you so much once again for everyone's time. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. guys. Thanks, everybody. Peace. Bye.